There was a book that I read a little while ago, and I'm just going to put this on the screen because I've been quoting it a lot or using it a lot, um, but uh, this book is called iGen, and uh, it's about the newest generation, and it's about what is new with this generation, the differences, and what is going on with them. iGen is a generation that was born between 1995 and 2012. It's unique, but Jesus is for every generation. That's your first thing to write down there. I want you to I want to always be reinforcing that that Jesus is for every generation. It doesn't matter who you are, when you were born, or what influences have shaped your life. Jesus is for you, and we all need to embrace him. He calls each one of us into fellowship with him. There's a lot of different generations in in our past or even right right here in this room. There's the silent generation from 1928 to 1945. There's the boomers from 1946 to 1964. Generation X, the millennials, and then iGen. I stands for internet individualism, irreligious, inclusive, insulated, and insecure. This is a lot of challenges for this generation. We're going to talk about, talk about one major one today. There's a lot of modern technology that has shaped this generation. And uh, because of that, there are certain things that some older people, some of us, including myself now, because I'm kind of farther up the, the generational ladder here, there's some things that we went through when we were younger that this newer generation is not going to experience. Just a few things here. Basic skills that uh, kids no longer possess thanks to modern technology. Number one, answering a phone having no idea who's on the other end. You remember perhaps having to pick up the phone and saying hello and having it be actually a question because you didn't know who was there. You didn't have caller ID. Yeah, that's something that kids today probably will not know what is like. Or writing in cursive. I remember learning to write cursive. Who learned how to write cursive? Okay, almost everybody. But yes, when you're writing in cursive, you compared to just printing, it can look like hieroglyphics to somebody who's never had to read cursive before. So yes. Or getting lost and defending your decision not to stop at the gas station to ask for directions. When you have Google and GPS, you don't need to ask for directions anymore and you don't need to have to try to claim that you know the right way. So the, uh, the oldest argument between husbands and wives is uh, not really as relevant anymore. Or here's one that might actually go a little bit farther back than me. Grumbling about how many zeros are in a radio station's phone number when you're trying to be the sixth caller for concert tickets. <laughs> Maybe some of you have gone through that, but uh, there used to be, for younger people, there used to be phones that when you dialed them, you would have to stick your finger in this hole and rotate this rotary phone around. And on the zero on that dial would be the one you'd have to go all the way around for. So if there were a bunch of zeros, you'd have to be going all the way around. That, some of you probably don't even know what I'm talking about, do you? <laughs> oh, how about completing chores while your computer boots up and connects to the internet? Remember those old sounds of the computer connecting online? <laughs> No, the kids are not going to hear that. That's such a shame. <laughs> or finding a date without using an app. You know, there was a time when you had to actually go out and meet people and you didn't get to like or swipe other people around. Or getting your news from a newspaper. You know, some of, I know some of you get newspapers, but, but uh, really newspapers are becoming a thing of the past. You know, when, when you have to actually read from a pay, piece of paper from a tree that, that says what's going on in the world. And you can't just find out instantly anymore. 
Anyways, technology shapes how we do things in our daily lives, and it has a profound influence on us whether we acknowledge it or not. And so, different technologies have shaped different generations, and it's had quite an impact on them. All right, let's look at the text here. Romans 6, 15 through 23. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when, if you present yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death or of obedience which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart of to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at the time from those things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and become slaves to God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's a lot that this text is talking about. I want to call your attention to just a few things here, though. It says here that Jesus paid the price of freedom for his people. When we are in sin and we are not under Christ, we are slaves of sin. And so Jesus, when he died on the cross, he paid the ransom so that we could be set free. He bought our freedom. If you're a slave then you need to earn your freedom somehow or you need to be bought from a slave master. So on the cross, Jesus paid that freedom for us. And I really like the way Titus 3 puts this here. It shows the progression from us becoming slaves to becoming heirs. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs, according to the hope of eternal life. So, I put in bold, slaves, you notice that? And then He saved us, and now, at the bottom, we are heirs. We have quite a progression here. So, verse 15, As saved people free from sin, can we sin as we like? No way. Absolutely not. Perish the thought. Heaven forbid. Think about... Let's pretend, just imagine for a minute, imagine that you're a slave. Imagine that somebody owns you, you are not free, and all you do is work for a slave master. Let's say this slave master is abusive and is really mean to you. He treats you just like an object. And let's say, let's say your job is something really awful, like emptying chamber pots. I mean, slaves did the worst of the worst kinds of work. Let's say that's you. And let's say one day somebody, a benevolent merchant of some kind, took pity on you and decides to buy you. And instead of making you his slave, he takes you in as a son or a daughter. So now you're, you're a child. And now... You not only are a child, you are legally adopted, and now you have opportunities for education, you have your freedom, 
You have opportunities for work, to earn money for yourself. You've been totally changed in your status. Now let's say, now that your status is totally changed, let's say you decide, you know what? I think I miss my old master and emptying chamber pots for him. Maybe I'll go back and do that. Really? This, this, is, this is what's really going on. If you're, if you're a believer, why would you go back to sin? Why would you go back to emptying chamber pots for a slave master who beats you when you could be a child of somebody who actually cares about you and wants the best for you? What? Why? Believers belong to Christ and not sin. So verse 16, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, and the reason why he says that is because back then, if you had a debt that you could not pay, and you were about to be foreclosed on, you could sell yourself into servitude or slavery in order to pay off that debt. And that happened quite a bit in Roman times. But it says, You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. You are slaves to the one you obey. So you're going to go, are you going to obey the one who freed you and adopted you as a child? Or are you going to obey the abusive slave master who doesn't care anything for you at all? Who are you going to obey? We all obey something. Now, we in the United States here, we come from a long tradition that started with something called the Enlightenment, where we value independent thinking and freedom and independence. And this goes a long way back. We, we value these things. So we like to think that we're independent thinkers, that we don't depend on a church or a government to tell us how to think and how to live, we are free to make our own decisions. And we are not slaves of anyone. That's what we would like to think. And we value that. And there's a lot of value to that. But, what this passage is saying here is basically that whether there's a government or a church or whatever that's manipulating you or not, even if there's not, you are still a slave of something. You're serving something. You're obeying something. We were created to love and to serve. We were created to love and serve God. And if we're not loving and serving Him, then we're loving and serving something else and becoming a slave to it. And that can be all kinds of things. We can do that with our jobs. We can do that with a spouse or a relationship. We could be even slaves to our kids if we allow it. Or we could be a slave to a movement or a cause. And what we obey first reflects where our priorities are and where our hearts are. Look at the screen here with me. Let's answer this together. What is idolatry? Idolatry is having or inventing something in which one trusts in place of or alongside of the only true God who has revealed Himself in His Word. So, we have, we have a God who we can love and serve. And sometimes we might try to love and serve other things on the side. And that is called idolatry. So, choose carefully what you obey is one lesson we can take from this particular passage. Choose carefully who you obey. Because if you could choose your master, you would want to make sure that you're choosing a master who actually cares about you. Somebody who actually wants the best for you. If you, you would not want to choose a master if you were a slave. You wouldn't want to choose a master who's going to beat you and treat you poorly. Now, verse 16. Sin leads to death. Obedience to Christ leads to righteousness. This is basically what the, 
what the passage is saying. You can obey God, you can follow Jesus Christ, and you can walk this path that leads to righteousness and sanctification, glorification, all of the wonderful things that God wants for you. Or you could walk the path of sin, and you can die a slow death. It's your choice. Now, let's talk about these things for a minute. Let's talk about these. These are smartphones. They have touch screens. They can access the internet. They are very useful tools. Many of you have one of these, I know. And I know that you find it pretty useful. If you didn't, you probably wouldn't have one. I know there's some of you who don't have one, but I know most of you do, and I know that most of you find these things pretty useful. They can do a lot of things. They give you quick access to information. They allow you to communicate with others very quickly and easily. They help you make plans and stay organized. I have a, I have a Deirdre and I have a schedule on, on Google, and so we know where each other is all the time, and that really helps if... Uh, We want to get a hold of each other or make plans for something else. And it helps you stay updated on what's going on in the world or what the grandkids are doing and to see their cute pictures and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of good things about this. I don't want to just say that these things are terrible, we should all burn them or anything like that. They're very useful. But... I know that you know the benefits of it, so I'm not going to dwell on that too long. For many, these things dominate life. For many people, these things take over your life. And it's true, in particular, of the generation that was raised with them. Some of us remember a time without them. And so... We kind of have that contrast, but if you were raised with them, then you are kind of shaped by them, more so than others. iGen high school seniors average six hours a day on new media. That basically is anything you can access with a smartphone. That varies little by economic class or race or gender or anything like that. About six hours a day. About two and a quarter hours a day texting, two hours a day on the internet, one and a half hours a day on electronic gaming, and uh, let's see, about a half hour a day on video chat. So this is the averages, six hours a day. Phones less often are tools we use and more often masters that use us. This is supposed to be a tool that we use, but often it's something that commands us. And isn't it ironic that the very posture that we use, when we use them, is kind of this bowing posture. Isn't that ironic? You almost have to bow to use them. You don't see people doing this very often. Once in a while, maybe, but usually it's this. We are literally bowing to these things when we use them. And we are kind of at their beck and call. These things buzz or chirp or ring and right away we go to them and see what's, what's there. The average teen checks their phone over 80 times a day. That's an average. And here's a quote that's from the book that I wanted to put up on screen here, nearly all of their leisure hours are now spent with new media. The hour and a half of leisure time that's left is used up by TV. So this is, this is the average iGen's life. Twelfth graders spend two times more time online in 2015 than in 2006. That's just nine years. It was one hour a day in 2006. It's over two hours a day in 2015. And these things are designed, and they even have a name for it. It's called persuasive design. 
apps are designed to harness subconsciously our minds and to be addictive so that we will use them more. They're, they're actually designed that way. So, for example, the dot, dot, dot that appears when somebody is texting you back, that's designed to keep you on because it's telling your brain that a reward is coming soon. It creates a stress response because waiting also stimulates dopamine release for building anticipation, which is going to bring you back and spend more time on it. These people are not dumb who design these things. They know how to generate time used and to keep us on. It's interesting how whenever we have questions, this has the answers. Usually you think of going to God for the answers. You know, well, these things are almost omnipotent because you can connect with Google and Google knows everything. We give it all kinds of personal information, our name, credit card numbers, all of our likes and dislikes, and now it's starting to realize, boy, they they know a lot more about us than we want them to know. Some people even give it naked selfies. They encroach on responsibilities. They kind of function like a god that way. Education is suffering in, in this iGen. Kindergartners are needing help with speech right now. Not because they have speech impediments, but because adults are not talking to them that much anymore. There's, iGen spends two hours a week less on homework than teenagers in the early 90s. SAT scores are down. They, just, they encroach on our responsibilities. They encroach on relationships How many of you have been to a restaurant and seen a group of people, perhaps a family, that were all sitting at the same table and everybody was on their phones? How many of you have seen that? Lots of people. It happens all the time, doesn't it? Listen to what one 13-year-old says. I would rather be on my phone in my room watching Netflix than spending time with my family. That's what I've been doing most of the summer. I've been on my phone more than I've been with actual people. I'd rather be on my phone watching Netflix than time with my family. Their overuse is also hazardous to our mental health. And this is something that I learned recently. Sleep suffers. Teen sleep time is actually getting shorter. 8th, 10th, and 12th graders are getting less sleep now than ever before. And teens that spend three plus hours a day on electronic devices are 28% more likely to get less sleep. And getting less sleep is not only bad for your health, it's bad for your mental health. I mentioned this last week, I'm going to mention it again. IGEN is on the verge of the most severe mental health crisis for young people in decades. In 1983, 4% of high school seniors were seeing a professional therapist. In 2015, it was 11%. That's a huge jump. The college freshman survey that every college freshman takes, or not every college freshman, but they survey college freshmen, It says, every indicator of mental health issues on the survey reached all-time highs in 2016. Every mental health indicator. Not just some. That includes saying that your emotional health is below average. That includes saying you feel overwhelmed or expecting to seek counseling or feeling depressed. Teens with more screen activities are more likely to be unhappy. Unhappy, unhappiness correlated most with number one, internet, number two, social networking, number three, texting. Interestingly, what correlated most with being happy was sports and exercise, number one, and number two, going to church. If you're somebody who's exercising, playing sports, and going to church, you are much more likely to be happy. And similar results for being depressed. Actually, number one correlation with being depressed was social networking websites. 
Social media makes it quick and easy to see the parties you weren't invited to, how much more attractive others are when the best pictures that they post, how many likes you get versus everybody else, how many friends and followers you have compared to everybody else, and it's all quantified so you can feel inferior to others. Here's what one person said. Scrolling through my feed, seeing my friends being happy makes me sad, also because I get no messages. The sight of a message box with no notifications makes me really sad, a gut-wrenching feeling of loneliness. You're constantly hearing about what this person did and what was really awesome. It always makes me wonder, what am I doing? What should I be doing? Is it enough? Teen suicide is rapidly increasing and phones are the major culprit. 46% more 15 to 19 year olds killed themselves in 2015 than in 2007. And for 12 to 14 year olds, it was two and a half times more. This is a major problem. And these numbers started to go up when more and more people started to own these. Saying, I can't do anything right, my life is not useful, and I do not enjoy life or at all-time highs for 8th and 10th and 12th graders right now. The problem is not academic pressure. Homework time is actually down, as I said before. And doing your homework actually correlates with being happy. That's not the problem. Teens spending more than three hours a day on electronic devices are 35% more likely to have at least one suicide risk factor. And that is true across race or gender or whatever grade that you're in. The risks start to increase at screen time, which is TV or this, at two hours a day, and it goes up from there. Verse 16 again. You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Tools help you. Gods own you. If this is a tool, then it is useful to you. If this is a God then it owns you, it controls your life, it dominates your life, it takes away from the other more important things in your life. What is it for you? If you have God as your God, then you will thrive. If this is your God, your unhappiness and your suicide risk goes up. So some suggestions for not letting your phone become your God. Some suggestions, ideas for you. Observe a Sabbath from your phone. Have one day a week where that phone does not get turned on. You don't turn it on. If you're traveling and you want want it for safety, maybe take it along with you, but keep it turned off. You can turn it on if you absolutely need it. Phones are kind of like work, and God said, realized that work was going, could take over our lives, and so he said, you know what, I want, on one day I want you to not do any work at all. I want you to take time to worship me. So set aside that whole day for worship, so that work does not encroach on that, so that work doesn't become your God, so money doesn't become your God. <coughs> Make prayer not the phone, your first and last activity of the day. There was a lot of stories that I was reading in this book about how people turn their phone on the first thing in the morning and it's the last thing they do, turning it off before they go to sleep. Or sometimes people even sleep with it on. Some people even sleep with it under their pillows. One person actually said, having my phone closer to me while I'm sleeping is a comfort. Okay, if this phone is your comfort then that means you are emotionally dependent on it. It's your God. This is not your partner. This is not your friend. This is not your lover. This is a phone. This is a tool. 
You wouldn't sleep with a hammer under your pillow. Don't sleep with this under your pillow. This is something directly from the book. Kids, I might get some flack for this, but this, was, this really stood out to me, so I'm going to have to put this out there. From the book, put off giving your child a cell phone as long as possible. The links between social media use and depression are strongest for younger teens, particularly 8th graders. 8th grade the most, then 10th, then 12th, but it was true of all of them. Have social media on the computer that is shared by the family, not a constant access smartphone. If you want to give your kids a phone, if you're concerned that they need to contact you, give them a dumb phone. One that flips. Remember those? One that is a little less user-friendly so you don't become addicted to using it. Love the one nearby before the one texting far away. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to translate it in the most strict of the Greek, he essentially says, love the one nearby. So when that guy challenged Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. He was just walking by. He was nearby. That's your neighbor. It's hard to love the one who's right in front of you when you're doing this. When you're concentrating on someone else far away, trying to communicate with somebody else far away. Love the one nearby. The second greatest commandment. Phones are actually good for sharing information, but they're not good at connecting with people in a real, personal way. They're great for information. They're not good for relationships. And last, just to wrap it up, obey the God who loves you, not the object that can destroy you. If you use these things too much, they take over our lives and they actually become dangerous to our mental health. Don't obey them. They are your tools. They are not your masters. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Follow the Lord who loves you, not an object that would use you. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God in heaven, it's easy to make gods out of the useful tools that we have, even the phones that we have. Lord, help us to see you as you are, the God who loves us, who wants the best for us, who actually obedience to you helps us to thrive. Help us to see our phones for what they truly are tools that are useful, but not masters to obey. Lord, help us in our walk with this, especially in this new era of technology where that can be challenging. Lord, please be our God and help us to love you always. In Jesus' name, amen.